Hey, podcast listeners, it's Savannah here, producer of Corporate Competitor Podcast, and we're thrilled to announce our return to weekly episodes. Our goal is to help you grow each and every week. Speaking of growth, most of you know that Dawn is one of the most in-demand speakers on the public circuit. So as your company is preparing an upcoming gathering, I wanted you to know about his newest and most popular keynote on the art of storytelling. Dawn teaches you how to connect deeply with any audience, big or small. You can now move beyond mere numbers and engage stakeholders with stories that resonate and inspire. Remember, this skill is teachable. Harness the techniques that make Dawn the greatest storyteller in America, as Simon Sinek and John Maxwell have said time and time again. If you want to learn more, visit DawnJaeger.com slash storytelling to reach out to our team. What do most Fortune 500 executives have in common? After more than 150 conversations with executives from companies like Disney, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, I've learned that sports is a common denominator. Some of our guests' athletic experiences earned them a place in their sports hall of fame, like Chick-fil-A chairman Dan Cathy. Some hung up their cleats after high school, like Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian, while others, like Condoleezza Rice, claim they weren't that great in their sport, but no matter their skill level, they have all told me that being a part of a team taught them leadership lessons that they still use today. In partnership with Chief Executive Magazine, I'm your host, Don Yeager, here to give you an all access pass to genuine, authentic, fireside chat-like conversations with today's business icons so that you can create powerful change in your organization. This is Corporate Competitor Podcast. With me for today's episode is one of the greatest motivators of all time, Deion Sanders, affectionately known as Coach Prime. I had the incredible honor of working with Coach on his new book, Elevate and Dominate, 21 Ways to Win on and Off the Field. The ultimate playbook of inspiring personal stories and winning strategies required to help us elevate and dominate in all aspects of our lives. The 21 strategies for success draw from Coach's remarkable journey, encompassing stories about his amazing upbringing and his love of his mother who worked tirelessly to provide for the family, his induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, his achievement in becoming a head coach for a Division I football team, and his role as a committed father to five distinguished children. You're in for a treat today. All of my favorite quotes from today's episode, as well as a link to the book, are available to download from corporatecompetitorpodcast.com slash notes. A leader don't have to say he's a leader. He just leads. He leads from the front, the back, the middle, anywhere. He's a leader. Everybody looks to a certain person. That's the leader. It don't matter where he's located or where he's positioned himself. Just because you're talking the loudest does not mean that you're the leader. A leader is someone who is a person of unity, a person that brings people together and lifts people up. And oftentimes they advance people. That's a leader. Coach, thanks for joining us. Man, I'm glad to be here. You are my man. I feel like you was living with me for quite some time. Huh? Well, I will tell you, the more time I spent with you, the more likely I was to run through a wall for you. Well, I, appreciate it. I understand why success comes your way. You're literally infectious. It's awesome. Well, I appreciate it. This book is going to bless a lot of people. Gleaning through it myself is so funny that uh, I was speaking at some conference and I said, if I had known that you had to do an audio part of the book, I probably wouldn't have done the book. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I, I enjoyed doing audio. I did. Did you? I really did because I got a whole thought process with the music underneath and the build up and really bringing those chapters to life, just using music and sound to uplift certain chapters. So I can't wait to hear it with that sound up under. I can't wait to hear it either. I'm excited. So, Coach, you know, at the very beginning, you said we are not doing a biography. You wanted to do a book. Right. That was about growth. You wanted to help the reader grow, mm-hmm. elevate, dominate, 21 ways to win on and off the field. 
Tell me, why did you want to make that the way that you attacked this book? This book has been in my spirit for well over a decade, probably a decade and a half. Like I had already had the name. I had the thought process. I just needed you to pin my thoughts because I have a hard time writing, but I could talk it. I could say it. I could articulate it because I barely ever write things down. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much like a navigational system, I believe, to success mm. in different parts of your life. We all want to win this game of life, I call it. I'm in the third quarter, up probably about 21 points. <laughs> I'm dominating this thing right now, but I want others to attain success as well and to enjoy life immensely. Powerful. Like, I'm sitting up here looking at the chapters in front of me, and it says, make confidence your natural older Confidence means everything. I wouldn't be who I am if I didn't involve confidence. You wouldn't be where you are if you didn't have that confidence to take my words and turn them into a book format. Certain people in life wouldn't be where they are if they didn't develop the type of confidence. And that comes from working, working, perfecting, perfecting trials and tribulations and storms and still standing. You may smell like smoke knowing that you came through your fire, but you're still standing, consistency of performance is your best job security. Be who you say you are. Well, we have a multitude of the country trick-or-treating right now. <laughs> and it ain't even October. <laughs> but be who you say you are. If you say you're kind, darn it, be kind. If you say you're hilarious, make me laugh. Like, be who you say you are. And being confident, this is the tricky one. I want to conversate with you on this one. Be confident and humble at the same time. Mm. That statement could be somewhat contradicting if you just glance at it, but you really have to sit and digest it. So tell me when we were having our conversation, what did you gather from being confident and humble at the same time? Well, what I saw was your ability to be so confident driven by a belief that you had done the work. There's something about you and the way you believe that makes others believe that projects is humility. And it's funny because at the same time, you're right. There are a lot of people that want to say, boy, that guy's just full of himself. Right. The truth is, the more they get to know you and the more I hope this book lets them do that, they will see that the reason you are confident is because you've earned that right and the work done creates a sense of humility and calmness within you that maybe others don't necessarily see. I don't think they can fathom it. It's almost like someone that's well prepared and studied for a test. Mm -hmm. And you ask them, how do you think you're going to do on this test? Well, I should dominate this test. I should make an A on this test. That's confident, but that's also humility. Right. Because you're prepared. You're prepared. What do you want me to say when I know I'm prepared for the task? Mm -hmm. How do you want me to respond? Don't allow my confidence to offend your insecurity because the majority of this country is somewhat insecure. What well, isn't that the truth? By all means. You know, I'd love to ask you about belief. The videos that you have challenging, you know, when you say, do you believe? Do you believe? <laughs> the energy that comes out of those people as a result of you challenging them. Why is belief such an important word for you? It's been such an important word for me ever since I was a child. When people looked at me and said I was too small. I didn't come from the right side of town or I wasn't going to get the opportunity, but I never doubted me because I knew the work that I was going to put in and the work that I had already put in in the gift God had given me. You marry that gift with work, extraordinary work and understanding of the time and the moments. I just always believe I've never looked at an obstacle and thought that I can't handle that. I can't dominate that. I can't succeed in that. It's so funny. We had my leadership class with probably about 15 leaders on the team that I simulated. And I talked to them about Meshach, Shadrach, and the Bendigo. I talked about the faith and the confidence that they had. And they said, we're going to throw you in the fire. And then I brought out the point that the Bible states that the men that took them to throw them into the fiery furnace were killed because of the heat that the king asked to make it seven times hotter. So I'm trying to figure out how in the world did the men die that was taking them into the furnace because the miracle had already started right then. 
They had to walk in on their own then. Right. <laughs> they could have turned and run. They could have turned and run. And you talking about confidence and you talking about unity. All it took was one. All it took was one man to say, oh, I ain't signing up. I'm not. Oh, I just seen several people die right there. I'm not doing this. I'm going to turn. Oh, I'm good. I had a good life. I was somebody. I was, you know, over affairs and everything. And you want me to come in? No, I'm not doing that. All it took was one. But they stuck together, unified. And they had confidence that no matter what happened, that God had their backs. Mm. And that's the confidence that I try to display on a daily basis. Wow. You wanted to make sure they understood that you had it. You believed in you, right. but you also believed in them. But they had to believe in themselves. They had to believe in themselves. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They uh -huh. had to believe in order to walk into the fire. Right. They must. I mean, you talk about a unified sport. It's a team sport. But individuals get drafted. Individuals get compensated. Individual gets highlighted and showcased. Also the team somewhat, but the individuals. So I need you to do your individual job like no other because you believe that you can. And that will ultimately help the team win in every aspect. We try to build a whole man, not just a football man. Mm. Because if he's confident in school, he could be confident in the football. If he's confident in football, then he could be confident in school. If he's confident in school, confident in football, he could be confident in the community. Build a whole man. That is so important and, and often missed. We think the way that you are going to be judged is wins and losses, the final scores of games. Right. I asked you one day, what's a successful season? And your line was, we'll know in about 20 years when we see how these guys turn out. Right. I'm not judged as a coach by the same criteria that other coaches are judged. I'm not judged on the transformation that we went from, from winning one game to winning four, then what we're going to exponentially grow this year. I'm not judged by the sellout for every season home game. I'm not judged by the 21 million that we made for the city on every game weekend. I'm not judged by the 800% of sales increase for our apparel. I'm not judged by the influx of applications to even enter this school. I'm not judged by any of those wonderful things or the ratings that we accumulated. I'm not judged by that. They just judge me by a win or a loss. It's far greater than that. What if these kids hadn't throughout their whole tenure here? What if these kids turn out to be wonderful young men, wonderful fathers or wonderful siblings to one another? What if these young men turn out to be world changers and world leaders? I mean, it's so many things to judge by. You can't just judge us by game. Right. But it's far bigger than that. Yeah. You know, I want to ask you about iron sharpens iron. I like that. We're better when we're surrounded by people who can make us better. You talked to me about the greatest football you ever played was on the practice field against Jerry Rice. Nobody ever got to see it. Yeah. Nobody got to see me practice against Jerry Rice. Nobody got to see me practice against Andre Risen or Michael Urban. Nobody got to see those tasks. That's iron sharpening iron. That's when that transformation happened that you were able to go into the game confident because the guy you were playing against was not as good as the guy you practiced against. Mm. Although there was no hand clap, there was no people serenading you and loving on you or being critical. You had practice. It was just practice. But practice was the place where I perfected my craft. I wanted to be the best. So if you want to be the best, you got to challenge the best. You got to put your best foot forward on a daily basis. It's easy for someone to be critical when they're on the sideline, but not when you get your butt out there. You can say what you want, but can you do it? Why would you listen to your critics when your critics have critics? That's something I can't even comprehend. Why, why am I going to listen to a fool that can't even do what I'm capable of doing? I ain't got time for that. And you're not going to whoop me with a pen when I have the propensity to tweet back, post back, write back at you. You're not going to beat me that way. Right. You should always be hungry for knowledge and hungry for the education of advancement. You should always desire to go to the next level. You should never get so comfortable with your seatbelt on and your lazy boy with a remote control in your hand when you doze off and fall asleep at the wheel. You can never be that person. You got to always want more. It's never a satisfaction. It's like you're never full. You're always somewhat hungry where you may not need a full course meal, but you may need a snack here, a snack there. Never get so full that you don't want to go after more. See, I've never been satisfied. Just wanted to be the absolute greatest. My leadership group in our session, I say, who wants to be great? Of course, all of them raise their hand. Who wants to go pro? Of course, all of them raise their hand. I say, what else do you want? 
I want to take care of my mother, you know, be debt free. I want to be all pro. I want to do this. I said, you know, the difference between me and you guys, what coach? I wanted to be the greatest ever. Mm-hmm. See, all those other things will come. All those other things will come when you accomplish that goal. You guys just want to go to Pro Bowl. You guys want to do this. I want to be the greatest ever. That's the difference. Having that thought process and that mindset, that was never a satisfaction because most people enjoy the culmination of the fact of the game, whatever. I enjoy the journey. Yeah. And I've always been my worst critic. I may have played a game that no one caught a ball, but I knew on that route he could have had me if they had thrown. Mm -hmm. So now I got to go back and sharpen up on that route that I was a little delinquent on, that I was a little hesitant on, that I wasn't as aggressive that I should have been. Judge yourself and be authentic with your judgment and your criticism of yourself. But criticize yourself happily, not angrily. Mm. So how do you continue to push yourself even today? Still fired up about the journey. Are there ever bad Dion days? Mm -mm. I don't have bad days. I have bad moments, even bad hours, but never a bad day. How do you keep that from happening? Because I have the remote control of my life. You don't have that. I'm not giving you the propensity to have that over me. I'm not giving you the batteries included. I'm not giving that to you. You can't turn me up and turn me down, turn me on and turn me off. I can't allow you to have that over me. I can't do that. You got to understand, man, I'm always trying to get to the next level. You got to put something out in front of you. What's your rabbit? Everybody out there has a rabbit. Going to the dog track as a kid when I wasn't supposed to be there. And seeing those rabbits run inside of that track and those dogs with the most beautiful greyhounds trying to apprehend that rabbit, knowing they couldn't catch him, but he was always out there in front. I'm not going to catch it, but I'm going to go get it. I'm going to always try to attain it and go get it. Everyone has to have a rabbit chase it. Absolutely. Speaking of this idea, iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm. I love your Aflac commercials with Nick Saban. Love it. What a cool mixture of the two of you. But in any one of those shooting days, I know there's some downtime. Tell me about those conversations. Is there a story? Is there something that you might share with me? Yeah. I went to Coach Saban with a problem before the season started. He was shooting a commercial. And he said, you know what I did? And he gave me an illustration, a true illustration of what he did in a similar situation. Mm. I was like, Coach, I can't do that, Coach. But I do that. I'm going to get criticized and scrutinized. Like, right. Just telling you, that's what it's going to come to. And I'll be darned. It came to that. I had to end up doing what he told me I needed to do in the beginning. I didn't doubt that he was right. It was just the timing that I couldn't pull off. He's my hero, the coaching guru. I don't think anyone will ever eclipse what he's accomplished in college sports. And I respect the heck out of him for all the wisdom all the conversation. He knows I'm just prompting him to keep going. I don't say too much. I just say, and for real, you're choking. <laughs> and that just keeps him going. There's a great lesson there. Yeah. You have an opportunity. You have a window with a legend, somebody that you can learn from. Mm-hmm. And instead of jumping in, you use and really, and then you continue to get more. Iron sharpens iron. No matter where you are in your career, get a mentor, get somebody that you look up to but they also look out for you. Mm. Look up, but you want them to look out. I like that. And looking out for you. Man, that's powerful. Another one of my favorite chapters in your book, because this was so applicable to all of us. In chapter 12, you use the phrase, your time is your most valuable coin. You learned early this important that it's the one equalizer. I don't have more time than you do. You don't have more than me. It's what we do with it that separates us. Mm -hmm. Talk to me. That's why jealousy and envy occurs so much, because they think it's only about the gift. It's not just about the gift that God has granted you and God has blessed you with that you polished to the point that it's an unbelievable gift. But we still have the same amount of time to execute and operate the gift. So time is my most valuable possession. It's my most valuable coin. And I'm very careful or who I spend it on and who I spend it with. Mm. Because time is unbelievable, man. We just got finished in the leadership group. I talked about their day and how they need to start off with 
accomplishing something and being successful in it. I don't give a darn if it's making up your bed. I don't give a darn if it's walking your dog. I don't care what is it. This is the goal. Get up and do it. And no excuses. I'm not talking about brushing your teeth, things you have to do. Take a shower or use the bathroom. You got to do that. Right. I'm talking about those other things that no one summoned you to do, but you're doing it anyway. It's a schedule. It's a routine that gets you going. Like I like my quiet time in the mornings. I like my time along with the Lord where I get my morning word and I put it out and execute it. Now I'm ready and I get myself mentally prepared for the day and nobody bothers me until I walk out that door. When I walk out that door, they know I'm ready. I'm ready for the battle. I'm ready for the fight because every time there's a knock on that door, somebody wants something. Ain't nobody coming in there to be a blessing. You know? <laughs> somebody wants something. Whether it's an opinion, whether it's a direction, whether it's guidance, whether it's a conversation, there's a knock on that door is something to be garnished. You know, you've made a couple of references already to this leadership team. Mm-hmm. You had it at Jackson State as well. well let, me, let me tell you this. You're going to like this. Let me tell you this. Okay. I pivoted. <laughs> and you don't like to pivot. I had a group that was somewhat the young men on the team that needed assistance, that needed help, guidance, that needed a navigational system. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes, those were the same guys that didn't want to attend. I'm sitting up here preparing a whole message and a whole conversation to try to edify all of us and try to take us to the next level and try to get you guys more intertwined with what we do here. None of you are starting right now. It's no starter in this group. There's guys that could help this team, but you're not starting. Mm. When I heard of the reluctancy to desire to come to this meeting that was only 30 minutes, one day a week. I prayed about it. I pivoted. And I changed that to a leadership group. Mm. Coaches, give me your two to three leaders. I mean, leaders, bona fide leaders in your positions. And they gave it to me. You know, a couple of guys, it's not a leader. It's a good player, but it's not a leader. It's two different things. I got the leaders. They're in there 15 minutes early. Everybody has pen and paper. They're hungry. They're sitting at the edge of their seats. Their body language don't say, I don't want to be there. They're 100% inclusive and thought-provoking and conversational, and I love it. Because now that I invest in the top, they go invest in the others, Mm -hmm. and now we ultimately get what we want. Because when I was investing in the others, they weren't investing in anyone, Mm -hmm. and it fell on deaf ears. So I had to pivot. I really had to pivot. I love that pivot. One thing you said a good player doesn't mean they're a good leader. And that's funny because for most of us, we think, well, you're only going to follow somebody who's really good at something. No. What makes a good leader? I don't have captains. I don't have C's on the jerseys of my leaders. I have an L or D, leader or dog. Every dog ain't a leader and every leader ain't a dog. Just because you walk in the front, that don't mean you're a leader. Just because you make the most money, that don't mean you're a leader. Just because you have the nicest home, and a multitude of fanfare and adulation, that does not constitute that you're a leader. You have a gift that attracts people. That don't mean you're a leader. Mm-hmm. A leader don't have to say he's a leader. He just leads. He leads from the front, the back, the middle, anywhere. He's a leader. Mm-hmm. It don't matter where he's located or where he's positioned himself. Just because you're talking the loudest does not mean that you're the leader. Just because you have the nicest clothes and the nicest things, that does not mean you're a leader. A leader is someone who is a person of influence, Mm. a person of unity, a person that brings people together and lifts people up. And oftentimes they advance people. That's a leader. So talking to the folks that you came with from Jackson and even a little bit about this pivoted leadership group is that you are incredibly vulnerable when you're in this conversation with these folks who are important to you. You share you in ways that most of the world will never get a chance to see. You tell them stories of your journey and your troubles and your challenge. Well, it's all about comfortability. I want you comfortable to the point that you forget that we're really having a conversation. It's just a natural progression. We film so much content around here with YouTube channel, several of those around, or the school's channel, as well as a documentary. 
that people forget that they're taping. It's just natural now. They're not acting. They're not doing this for the camera. That may be like that with the new guys in the first week, but after that, they're fine. It's that same way when you're talking to these young men. You want to get to a point where it's just like a family or friendly conversation. And if I take my shirt off, you feel strange. You know, that with your shirt on and my shirt is off. So the sooner or later you take your shirt off and you feel comfortable. Like, hey, man, we're chilling. It's hot in here. Everybody got their shirts off. Let's chill. Let's talk about this. So when I'm able to unapologetically discuss my trials and yet tribulations, not just my successes, not my wins, not my triumphs, but my trials and my tribulations, they identify, shoot, coach, just like me. Coach, you did this when you was my age. No, I did worse. Coach, you thought like this? Yeah, 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 I did. Sometimes I still do. To be transparent with these young men is vital because real is winning right now, man. Genuineness is winning right now. Like Halloween and trick or treat ain't winning right now. The most True, honest, genuine people, even if they're flawed, they're winning. Because more people can identify with them than that person that looks like she's hadn't done or he's had done anything wrong in their life, man. Being honest is winning right now. That's such a great lesson, but it's also maybe one of the hardest things for a lot of leaders to get because as people progress, they think they have to perform. Put on a show. Yeah, they want to conform. Quit trying to bend and break to satisfy someone else's appetite for you. Mm. You're not satisfied with your own appetite. Sooner or later, you're going to look in the mirror and you got to like what you see. Or if you don't, you're going to have to change. Mm. I foolishly love what I see. I just told a young man, patience. Patience is something I'm working on on a daily basis. You guys are helping me work on it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, shadows definitely helped me transform my patience. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I was in your car when Shiloh was calling you from Jackson State. You were letting him know that he was not top of the five children. Yeah, yeah. So you love being a coach. Mm -hmm. You really love it. Yeah, I love coaching. Why are so few great athletes capable of making the transition? Because they want to uh, find themselves in every young man. I had a wonderful career and I'm not looking for me. I'm not searching for me. I'm not trying to create another me. I'm trying to find out what these kids are really good at and really coach them to be great at what they're good at. That's a different approach. A lot of former players probably weren't satisfied with their careers in some form or fashion and they're trying to live vicariously through those young men. Sometimes they get a little hard on them or they get a little soft on them. I don't know the formula, but I know the formula that I have, man. I just want to serve as a navigational system for these young men. I don't want them to falter to some of the things that I fell for and fell to, but I want to show them the path to success. It's hard for you to take somebody somewhere that you hadn't been. Mm -hmm. Really hard. It takes a lot of conversation, a lot of direction to get somebody someplace you hadn't been. Yeah. I had the chance to interview a number of the women who worked there in the football facility. They talked about the meeting that you had where you brought them into the room and you talked to the players about the importance of being respectful. Mm -hmm. A person had tears in their eyes when they said no coach had ever treated them that way. Mm -hmm. But you said it was about you setting a standard for the men that you were being asked to lead, setting a bar being unapologetic about the fact that if you don't reach this bar, this is one you will not be forgiven for. Yeah. I mean, you let the players know if you mistreat these women, you might as well just go home and don't have mama call me. It has to be standards. It has to be a bar. It has to be something that you're holding one another accountable. You can't just let these kids have this wonderful candy shop around here and they're already making money off the field, which we love. But the thing about money escalate who you really are. Fool broke is going to be a fool rich. This is just how it is. It just escalates to the problem in the situation. We want to respect not just one another. We want to respect yourself. There's no way that you could disrespect a woman in here and say you have respect for yourself. There's no way. Mm. What if somebody disrespected your mother when she came up to the game the same way that you disrespected that woman? Now you want to fight. Mm. Now you want to sell it with fists. 
Now you want to get out of character and get out of who you really are. I don't believe in that. I don't condone it. We're just trying to get these young men prepared for the next level life. They don't have to be professional football players, but they need to be professional. They need to be professional. That's true. So your first year at Jackson State, team was four and three. The next thing you know, you're winning the conference two years in a row. Right. You go to Colorado, you open with three big wins, and then you have several weeks in a row, things don't go as planned. Mm -hmm. Where do you learn the most from your wins or your losses? I never got my butt kicked to say, oh, I learned a lot of day for that. <laughs> I, never, I don't know who says that. It's just like somebody sitting on the bench. You know, when you go into the pros, you may not start your first few weeks. And it's like, you want to learn a lot? I'm going to learn a lot sitting over here. Who said that? Who? How do you learn from not playing? I don't understand that. No, I learn more from winning than I learn from anything. Losing is depicted on how you lost. I mean, we got our butts kicked twice, but we lost several other games from a touchdown or less. Close. Yeah, that gives you hope. That gives you faith. That makes you say, okay, I got to fix that. I got to fix that. I need to fix that. I got to do something about that. And then you fix it. You go get it. Losing identifies your lack thereof. Winning causes you to really take a look at what provoked you to be successful. And now you try to perfect it and do more of it. Yeah. That's tough. When you analyze these young men, when they think they come in here to interview you, you're really interviewing them. When we talked about getting smart, tough, fast, disciplined young men with character, we really mean that. These five words ain't just about football. It's also about life. We talk about being fast. It's not just fast on the field. It's being able to retain things and regurgitate things. Process things. Process things fast. Make decisions fast. You talk about tough. I'm old school, man. A lot of things that are condoned these days, they weren't condoned. You know, I don't... I have to catch myself because I want to say some things that I can't say because I'm a head coach. <laughs> Certain things wouldn't fly in that they allow now. Mm -hmm. We old school, man. We weren't missing practice unless there was something broken or something bleeding profusely. We weren't doing that. That's tough. Not only physical tough, but mentally tough. That's what we're looking for. Discipline. You know what discipline is. Mm -hmm. Having the propensity to get up and do it. When you know you need to run, you know you need to train, you know you need to lift, you know you need to eat, you know you need to rehydrate, all that stuff. Smart, tough, fast, discipline, and character. Character. Mm -hmm. Character is that person you are with nobody looking. Mm -hmm. Nobody's looking whatsoever. Character will take you much farther than your athleticism will ever take you. Having character. Mm -hmm. I don't mind you missing one of those attributes. But two or three of those attributes, you're really not for us. And we got to identify the players that are our type of players. Everybody wasn't called to play for me. I wasn't called to coach everybody. And that's just it. And that's nothing wrong with that. You guys are wonderful coaches around the country. There's some wonderful programs around the country. And you got thousands of kids that are really good at this game. You just got to pick the right ones for you. Character is so important to you. How do you judge someone's character because everybody puts on a show when they're with you i'm sure i'm 56 years old man i've seen a lot of shows matinees too <laughs> so, you know what's what you know through the journey that these kids have led on not only through college that we get so many out of the portal but through high school and the youth coaches we do a tremendous background because these scholarships are worth a lot more than they used to be mm. so you got to be sure yeah it's a big investment you know while working on the book, I had the chance to go be at your house and see you in a more non-football world where you're in your best environment. There's prime time and there's Dion. Right. Michael Strahan said this, prime is flashy, Dion is family. You found a balance. You found in this stage of your life, the ability to balance those two in ways that not everybody can. Well, you got to make sure you know the address of where those persons live. Mm. You got to know the address so you make sure they mail get to them. It's always an inconsistency, but you develop into what God has called you to be slowly but surely. Mm. It's not an expedition process because there takes development and development takes time. Even in a Kodak one step that we all had when we were a kid, you push the button and it takes time for that picture to develop. So it, everything takes time and you got to be willing to take the time and allow things to establish themselves. Mm -hmm. You got to know who you are and what you want and have a plan from the time you wake up and from the time you go to sleep. 
I work my plan and I plan my work. Mm -hmm. So I'm not mistakenly falling into anything. Everything I do comes from focus, comes from anticipation, comes from knowledge and wisdom and prayer. And I go get it. These two entities are making it possible for us to do the things that we're doing in Colorado and with my kids and in this country. Coach Prime and Dion, it's been a wonderful run. It's been a wonderful journey. I'm in third quarter of life and I'm winning. Yeah. The first day I was with you there in Boulder, you and I went to lunch at a place called BJ's Restaurant. I'll never forget this. We're walking to the door. You saw a tile in the area outside the restaurant that had been broken. Mm -hmm. But the piece that was broken was sitting about five feet away. You walked over, picked it up, and brought it back and put the tile back together. Nobody asked you to. There was nobody watching. You just put it together. When I asked you about it, you said later, I'm a fixer. It's what I do. I'm not one to leave something unsolved. I like to complete things. I don't leave run-along sentences with just a comma in it. I like to put a exclamation mark at the end of my sentences. I'm a natural born fixer. I like the conclusion of things. I like to finish what I start. Yes. You know, you talked about the importance of being straight with people. Your very first day in Colorado, mm -hmm. one of the videos that went viral was the time when you talked to the players about the fact that some of them, their future was going to be somewhere else. Right. There were all these critics and folks who were going, who says that? To their players, who walks in and on day one says that? An uh, honest man. An honest man. Let me tell you something. When a CEO takes over a business or corporation, what's the first thing that he or she does? They cut the fat. When a new president takes over, what happens to the cabinet? It's a new cabinet. <laughs> Why in the world would you think me taking over a 1-11 and 11 team, I'm going to leave it as it is? That's the dumbest thing ever. So now everything is on the coaches that left. You didn't give a darn about firing the coaches, but you care about firing the kids. The kids are the ones who lost the darn game on the field. Coaches had something to do with it in the development of all that. I understand that. I do understand that. But you got to understand, I was an elite player. I never blamed my coach, man, because I was coached to do this, to do this, to do this, and I did it. And if I did my job and he did his job and he did his job, we're going to win. When we did win, it's because somebody didn't do their job. It wasn't that we weren't coached for it. So I've never been one to blame a coach. What's so funny about those young men that chose to leave, we probably had a meeting with 20 guys at the most and said we may go in a different direction. Everybody else quit because the standard. Mm -hmm. They saw the standard was not the standard of old. Like the standard was going to be a commitment to excellence. The standard was going to be hustling. The standard was going to be attention to detail. The standard was going to be something that they can comprehend. So they X themselves out. If you ever change your expectation in life and your standards, watch how many people walk away from your life mm -hmm. that know they can't comply with the new you. Just change and see. What's exciting is when you change that standard and the right people walk into your life. There you go. Then you attract those people. Normally, we attract who we are. So if you're around some fools, look in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> circus people only hang with circus people. <laughs> there ain't no circus people hang with no regular people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Coach Prime, it has been my honor to be your teammate over this last year and to get a chance to learn so much from you. Thank you today. Thank you. For gracing everyone listening with your wisdom and thanks for being a corporate competitor with us. Thank you, my man. I appreciate you. I can't wait to people read this book, man. You did a wonderful job. You blessed me tremendously. Man, I have to tell you the best part about this, you all got a healthy piece of Coach Prime's time. How great is that? This guy has made me better at every turn. Let me start with three of my greatest takeaways and there are so many. My favorite chapter in the book is make confidence your natural odor. You get that confidence through working hard to perfect your craft, through trial, through tribulation. You may smell like smoke when you come out of the trials and the tribulations, but ultimately confidence will be left behind as your odor. And the fact that being both confident and humble, those two words can and should be used at the same time to describe 
a great leader, you should be able to have the confidence to be able to express yourself strongly, but do so with a humility that makes others want to listen. My second great takeaway about Colorado football, his commitment to building the whole man, not just the football man, the importance. What he wanted to make sure we understood is that our job as leaders isn't just to try to develop the technical competence of those who work for us, but to look at and say, what will it take to develop the whole person? Because a more complete teammate, a more complete person on our team will allow their technical skills to shine even brighter and to be even more impactful for us as a team. So don't just invest in what makes your teammates technically strong. Pour into all aspects of their life as best you can, and you will be a better team. And then I love when he talks about iron sharpens iron. It's always been one of my favorite conversations. Think about how he perfected his craft by lining up in practice against Jerry Rice, against Andre Risen, against Michael Irvin. For us to be successful in that same way, for us to be able to get better because we're competing against better, get better because we have other great talent in our midst, you have to adopt coach's belief that you can never be satisfied. You are never full. You're always hungry. To do that, you have to be your own critic, your own harshest critic. And he pointed out that there were lots of days when no one caught a ball on him. And statistically, everybody might say it was a great day. But he knew, he knew that there were two or three times where had the quarterback chosen to throw, Dion was out of place and they would have probably completed the pass. So instead of accepting the celebration of his success, he was his own harshest critic. He went back to work on what he needed to do to be better the next week. And he said, most people enjoy the game. I enjoy the journey. When he talked about having those leadership conversations with his own players, trying to encourage them to want to get better while in the competition against each other. And he pointed out, he said, most of you want to go to the NFL, even the Pro Bowl. I wanted to be the greatest ever. And if I was the greatest ever, all those other things would take care of themselves. It's a mind shift, as Coach was saying. It's a mind shift that we can all go to work on. I don't know about you, I'm ready to go out and be an even more effective corporate competitor. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. Feedback helps us spread the insights of our guests to a wider audience. It actually increases our ratings. Thank you so much for those who have done so in the past. And catch new episodes every Wednesday. Subscribe at corporatecompetitorpodcast.com to be the first to get a chance to listen. And as a thank you gift, I will send you a chapter from one of my best-selling books. Stay connected with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. My handle is at Don Yeager, D-O-N-Y-A-E-G-E-R. And until next week, I appreciate you.